dawn on a summer's day, 1943. The first rays of sunlight revealed a column of grey vehicles and men crossing a bridge over the Dnieper River. They were moving west. The column of some vehicles kept on coming day after day, night after night. From behind them came the sporadic sound of gunfire. Each burst caused the retreating Germans to cast anxious glances over their shoulders. But then they heard a new sound. The soldiers began to run and push their comrades aside. It was the squeal of tank tracks and the familiar roar of T-34 engines. The tanks approached the bridge at full speed. Then there was a deafening explosion. German demolition charges had collapsed three sections of the Kanyev Bridge. With them went the Soviet High Command's last chance of getting tanks quickly across the Dnieper. Soviet infantry had crossed the river at several points, but without tank support, the Germans were able to contain the small bridgeheads. After the German defeat at Kursk in August 1943, the front line began to race westwards. The Red Army advanced in overwhelming strength, with more than 2.6 million men and 2,400 tanks. The German High Command planned to make its stand at the Dnieper River. The army was ordered to dig in on its western bank to form the so-called Wotan Line. To slow the Soviet advance, von Manstein's army group began a scorched earth policy. Anything that could not be carried away was burnt or blown up. It was nothing less than the systematic destruction of eastern Ukraine. This was one of the climactic horrors in a country where the war claimed more than five million civilian lives, one in eight of the population. As the Germans retreated westwards, they destroyed all the bridges and tore up the railway lines. The advance across this devastated landscape put a huge strain on Red Army logistics. Fuel and ammunition had to be delivered by truck over hundreds of miles. Heavy artillery and bridging equipment struggled to keep up. North of Kiev, Andrei Kravchenko's 5th Guards Tank Corps became one of the first units to reach the Dnieper. Andrei Grigorovich Kravchenko was an experienced tank general whose brigade had played a key part in the Battle of Moscow in 1941. The following year, he commanded a tank corps at the Battle of Stalingrad, after which his unit was renamed the Stalingrad Guards Tank Corps. In 1943, he fought at the famous tank battle at Prokhorovka, part of the Kursk offensive. Kravchenko was rather heavily built for a tank soldier. 
In fact, he was so large that when he sat in the commander's seat, it was impossible to close the hatch. The wide Diesna River did not stop the tanks of Kravchenko's 5th Guards tank corps. Without waiting for the bridging units, his men made their tanks watertight and drove across. But the Dnieper was too deep to be crossed in this fashion. Only the infantry, using rafts and floats, were able to get across. They established small footholds on the far bank of the river. South of Kiev, an extraordinary attempt was made to get the 40th and 3rd Guards tank armies across the river. The Dnieper here was about 600 metres wide. Almost a 1,000 piles were used to build a temporary bridge able to bear the weight of a tank. The engineers worked under German artillery fire and aerial bombing. But after 10 days, the bridge was ready. T-34s from the 3rd Guards tank army began to roll across the Dnieper. Meanwhile, the Germans had been busy strengthening their defences. The Ukrainian capital, Kiev, lay on the far side of the river and would be almost impossible to capture by frontal assault. Therefore, General Vatutin, commanding the Voronezh front, decided on two flanking attacks from his bridgeheads across the river. Throughout October, Vatutin's troops struggled to fight their way out of the bridgeheads. As winter came, it seemed the front line itself had frozen solid. So Vatutin decided to change the plan. He would target just one bridgehead and use all his armoured formations to smash his way out. About 40,000 soldiers of the 3rd Guards tank army and hundreds of tanks moved north under cover of darkness. On the morning of the 5th of November, the Red Army attacked, immediately cutting the highway between Kiev and Zhitomir. The Germans' only escape route was blocked. Soon, the first T-34s were in Kiev, entering by the twisting road that runs through the ravines of the Nivki district. Today, this street is still called Tank Street. In the city itself, Burning buildings, tracer rounds and flares turned night into day. The Red Army tank crews smashed their way into downtown Kiev. The surviving Germans made a hasty exit. By dawn, the city was clear. General Kravchenko's 4th Stalingrad Guards Tank Corps could add another battle honour to their standard, Kiev. The Red Army liberated Kiev just one day before the anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution on the 7th of November. There were rumours that Stalin had given Vatutin a clear order. Take Kiev by the anniversary of the revolution at any cost. But this was probably not true. Otherwise, Vatutin would have sent his tank straight into Kiev. But instead, he'd chosen to first cut off the German escape route by encircling the city from the west. That winter, 
Ukraine was to be the scene of ferocious fighting. The vast open steppe, once frozen hard, was ideal terrain for tanks. Both sides poured in their armoured reserves. The Red Army's 6th Tank Army, the last to be created in the war, was formed in January 1944. It was to be led by the liberator of Kiev, General Andrei Kravchenko. His new army received its baptism of fire within days. By the beginning of 1944, the Red Army had advanced as far as Zhitomir and Kirovograd. But the Germans still held a bulge stretching east around the city of Kanyev. Hitler, with total disregard for the facts, believed this could form a launch pad for a future German counteroffensive. The Soviet High Command had its own plans for this bulge. The Korsen Shevchenkovsky offensive began on the 24th of January 1944. The attack was led by the second Ukrainian front. Two days later, the first Ukrainian front joined in on the opposite flank. The attack was led by the 245 tanks and self-propelled guns of Kravchenko's 6th Tank Army. Self-propelled guns, or SPGs, were heavy guns mounted on the chassis of a tank or some other vehicle. They were a mobile form of artillery used to provide fire support to infantry and tanks. Heavy versions, like the Soviet Su-152, were also effective at knocking out German heavy tanks like the Tiger. In just five days, Kravchenko's tanks had linked up with Rotmistrov's 5th Guards tank army near the village of Sveni Gorodka. Almost 60,000 Germans had been encircled. The trapped forces became known as Group Stemmermann, after the general commanding them. Two Soviet tank armies now turned south, prepared to repel any German rescue attempt. The encircled Germans fought on, in the firm belief that help would arrive. But all remembered the fate of Paulus's 6th Army at Stalingrad the previous winter. General Konyev, commanding the 2nd Ukrainian Front, had promised Stalin just such another victory. But Hitler was equally adamant that no such thing would occur. He told the encircled men, you can rely on me as on a stone wall, but for the present, stand firm and shoot as long as you have ammunition. General Huber, commanding 1st Panzer Army, radioed to Stemmermann simply, I shall release you, Huber. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Luftwaffe was able to resupply Group Stemmermann by air. Relying on air resupply had been disastrous during the Battle of Stalingrad. The Luftwaffe had not been able to get in enough supplies for 300,000 men, but Group Stemmermann was a fifth of that size. Meanwhile, von Manstein was assembling armoured units to make a rescue attempt. He turned to the 3rd and 47th Panzer Corps, commanded by Generals Niklaus von Formann and Hermann Breit. Hermann Breit was a highly experienced 51-year-old Panzer general. He was a veteran of the campaigns in Poland and France and had served with the Army General Staff during the invasion of the Soviet Union. He then commanded a Panzer division before leading 3rd Panzer Corps during the Battle of Kursk. The Soviets came under attack from four German panzer divisions. Reinforced by 80 Tigers and Panthers of the heavy panzer regiment Becker. In February 1944, the Red Army's main tank was still the T-34 armed with a 76mm gun. It was no match for these German heavy tanks. 
the Germans captured the village of Lysianka, but they were still a few miles short of breaking through to Group Stemmermann. And now Red Army reinforcements arrived, General Bogdanov's second tank army. Both sides found it extremely difficult to maneuver. If previous winters had been unusually severe, this winter was remarkably mild. Already the thaw had turned roads into rivers of mud. The Battle of the Corson Chakasi Pocket had become a decisive phase of the winter campaign. And it was here that a fearsome new Soviet tank made its first appearance the Yosef Stalin. The Yosef Stalin, or East II tank, was developed as a direct response to the German Tiger. Its front armor was 120 mm thick, comparable to a Tiger. And although less accurate and with a slower rate of fire, its powerful 122 mm gun was a serious threat to the German heavy tanks. The East II tanks were grouped into independent heavy tank regiments and assigned to crucial sectors of the front where a breakthrough was required. They were particularly effective at storming German towns and cities in 1945. Versions of the East II tank were still in service with the Russian army as late as 1995. The first combat between East Twos and Tigers and Panthers ended in stalemate. The Germans held on to their gains but could advance no further. Group Stemmermann was bombarded with leaflets urging them to surrender. General Seidlitz Kurzbach, who'd been captured at Stalingrad, appealed to them by loudspeaker. He was now a committed anti Nazi. A Soviet envoy was dispatched with proposed terms of surrender, but he was sent back. Group Stemmermann knew it was now up to them to fight their way out of the pocket. Fighting desperately, they got as far as Shenderovka, just five kilometers short of 3rd Panzer Corps. A furious Stalin telegraphed Zhukov. The reason for the enemy's breakthrough was that the weak 27th Army was not reinforced in a timely manner claimed Stalin. Rotmistrov's tank army was hurriedly redeployed to ensure there was no breakout. A February frost had frozen the ground hard, restoring momentum to operations. Breit was able to renew his advance on Shenderovka. At the forefront of the fighting was the 5th SS Panzer Division Viking, recruited largely from Scandinavian volunteers. But one by one, its vehicles were knocked out. Fuel resupply by air was erratic and often interrupted by bad weather. Field Marshal von Manstein, commander of Army Group South, well remembered the Stalingrad disaster. There had been no attempt by the encircled troops to fight their way out. This time, without consulting Hitler, he gave Stemmermann clear orders. Group Stemmermann must make the breakthrough itself to the line Zerzhentsi, Hill 239. There, it will link up with the 3rd Panzer Corps. The encircled divisions prepared for the last stage of their breakout. On the evening of the 16th of February, they destroyed heavy equipment and supplies, and at dusk began their advance. The Belgian Nazi Leon de Grel, who commanded the 5th SS Volunteer Sturm Brigade Wallonian, described the scene. At 2200, the Soviet batteries shelled the center of the village. The burning houses lit up the retreating troops as if it were daytime. This made it easier for the Soviet artillery spotters to do their job. The shells fell onto our huge column. To survive, we had to drop into the snow every second. That night, several units slipped through the lines to the 3rd Panzer Corps. The next day, Soviet attack aircraft were grounded by bad weather. But most units had still not reached safety 
Even worse, they found their rendezvous at Hill 239 was still in Soviet hands and heavily defended by T-34s. The Germans were forced to bypass Hill 239, but this put the Niloy Tikic River between them and the safety of their own lines. 20,000 men were trapped on the wrong side of a fast-flowing river. It was 30 metres wide, freezing cold, and there were no bridges. T-34s were approaching from the north. Desperate to escape, some men improvised rafts and lifelines to get across. But many panicked and hurled themselves into the icy water. Hundreds were drowned. Many succumbed to shock or hypothermia. In all, about half of Group Stemmermann managed to escape. But there had been 30,000 German casualties. Amongst them, General Stemmermann himself killed commanding the rear guard. It could have been much worse for the Germans. The Stalingrad on the Dnieper that Konyev had promised had failed to materialize. But it was still a heavy defeat for the Wehrmacht. Step by step, river by river, the Red Army was forcing the invader back. The Battle of the korsun cherkasy Pocket was only a prologue to Soviet success in Ukraine. The heavy losses sustained there by German panzer divisions meant Army Group South could no longer mount effective counterattacks. As the battle raged around the pocket, the first Ukrainian front was fighting its way westwards to liberate the cities of Rovno and Lutsk. Instead of tanks, General Vatutin was able to exploit his success with old-fashioned cavalry. As they swept forwards through the villages of Ukraine, another salient was formed, hanging over German Army Group South. The Soviet High Command moved two tank armies into this salient, intending to launch them southwards against the rear of General Huber's 1st Panzer Army. The offensive began on the 22nd of March, 1944. Three days later, 200,000 men of 1st Panzer Army were encircled. This new German pocket was centered on the city of Kamenetz Podolsky. Hitler ordered the 2nd SS Panzer Corps to be sent from France to rescue Huber's Panzer Army. With the help of these reinforcements and Huber's skillful handling of his troops, the 1st Panzer Army fought its way out of the trap. But most of their vehicles and heavy equipment had to be left behind. The rampant success of the Red Army in Ukraine had dramatic strategic implications. One was that the German High Command became convinced that the great Soviet summer offensive of 1944 would be launched in Ukraine. So it was here that they rushed their tank and aircraft reserves. But the Red Army's summer offensive, codenamed Operation Bagration, will be launched in Belarus. It resulted in the liberation of Minsk and the annihilation of German Army Group Center. German panzer reserves had to be rushed north to shore up the line. 
two remaining German panzer divisions in Ukraine were moved to the rear and put under General Breit's command. They were to be held back to counterattack any Soviet offensive. On the 14th of July, 1944, the first Ukrainian front attacked towards the city of Lvov. Breit's armored reserve moved forward to counterattack. But the Soviets now also controlled the air. On the march, wrote General von Melentin, the 8th Panzer Division, moving in long columns, was attacked by Russian aviation. It sustained great losses. Many tanks and trucks were burned. All hopes of a counterattack collapsed. The first Ukrainian front's advance led to the encirclement of the German 8th Army Corps near the town of Brody. Amongst its units was the 14th Waffen SS Grenadier Division, Galizia. The 14th SS Division was called in German Galizia, in Ukrainian Galicinia. Its recruits were anti Bolshevik volunteers from Galicia, a historic region of western Ukraine. In July 1944, the division was 15,000 strong. It was commanded by a German, SS Brigadefuhrer Fritz Freitag. In 1943, it had been engaged in anti-partisan operations. In the summer of 1944, it was at the front for the first time. General von Melentin described how the SS Division Galizia, holding positions in the woods, could not hold firm, so the Russians penetrated deeply into the left flank of our corps. There was to be no breakout from the Brody pocket. The survivors surrendered to the Red Army four days after their encirclement. The SS Division Galizia was reformed around the 3,000 men who escaped the catastrophe at Brody. It was later used to fight partisans in Yugoslavia. The division surrendered to the Western Allies in May 1945. Thanks to the influence of the Vatican, which viewed the men of the Galizia Division as good Catholics and devoted anti-communists, its members were able to avoid extradition to the Soviet Union. Instead, many settled in Britain and Canada. Now, Soviet tank armies raised towards Lvov. But the Germans had reorganized their defenses and were able to repel a direct assault on the city. So Soviet forces began to outflank the city from north and south. The news that Soviet tanks had been sighted west of the city caused panic the Germans abandoned the city. The Red Army crossed the border of the USSR almost unopposed. At the end of July, they captured the Sandomierzi bridgehead across the Vistula River. This would become the launch pad for the final offensive into Germany. The southern flank of the Eastern Front might have become a sideshow if it hadn't been for the vital factor of the Romanian oil fields. They were essential to the German war machine. Hitler would defend this resource at any cost. But he rejected a proposal to retreat to a new line based on the Carpathian Mountains, as suggested by Hitler's ally, the Romanian dictator Ion Antonescu. The only way through the mountains was an 80-kilometer-wide valley, known as the Foxani Gate. Here, Antoniescu was building 1,500 concrete pillboxes. Romania could have been turned into a formidable fortress, but Hitler was utterly inflexible on all questions of retreat. In the summer of 1944, the Romanian front followed the Dniester River, it was held by the German 6th Army. The 6th Army was formed in October 1939. The next year it marched into France and helped to seize the French capital. 
In 1941, it led Army Group South's invasion of Ukraine, but 19 months later, it was destroyed at Stalingrad. The army was reformed the following month under General Hollett. It might have been thought that the number six was unlucky for the Germans. But the army wanted to forget the catastrophe it had suffered at Stalingrad and instead revive the fighting spirit of its first years. This was the army that had marched victoriously through Paris and advanced fearlessly through Ukraine. Now it would defend Romanian oil. Ironically, Sixth Army had the same neighbors as it had at Stalingrad. Its flanks were held by the Romanian Third and Fourth Armies. The Stavka High Command planned another massive encirclement. The Second Ukrainian Front under General Malinovsky and the Third Ukrainian Front under General Tolbukhin were to deliver converging thrusts in order to encircle German troops on the Dniester River. Kravchenko's 6th Tank Army was transferred to the 2nd Ukrainian Front. It had not been in action for several months. It was rested and re-equipped, bristling with more than 400 tanks and self-propelled guns. This was the only Soviet tank army in southeastern Europe. Its role was to make the breakthrough to the Romanian oil fields before leading the advance on Hungary and Austria. Meanwhile, the other Soviet tank armies would lead the advance into Germany. Soviet preparations were made in complete secrecy. The Stavka's main concern was that the enemy would withdraw to the Foxani Gate before the offensive was unleashed. By 1944, the Red Army were masters of camouflage and concealment. The Germans on the Dniester River detected no build-up of Soviet strength. In mid-August, General Freter Pico, commander of the German 6th Army, reported that all was quiet on his front. Little did he realize it was the calm before the storm. The Soviet offensive across the Dniester began on the 20th of August, 1944. One German officer remembered, the divisional headquarters came under heavy Soviet artillery fire. From our vantage point, it seemed the entire Dniester Valley was covered with a dense cloud of smoke. The sun was completely blotted out. Romanian and German units were soon in complete disarray. In particular, they lacked the anti-tank defences to meet this onslaught of Soviet armour. On the third day of fighting, the 6th Army was ordered to retreat. By then, most of its escape routes had already been cut off. And as they withdrew, columns of German troops were strafed and bombed by Soviet aircraft. The 6th Army raced to get back across the River Prut. But as retreating German units approached the town of Hushi, they ran straight into Red Army T-34s, entering town on the other road. The tanks caused carnage amongst the retreating lorries and wagons. The next day, white flares were greeted with cheers from the Red Army soldiers. It meant that the second and third Ukrainian fronts had linked up. The Soviets had encircled the German 6th Army once again. The German and Romanian survivors were falling back to the river Siret. The offensive had been a stunning Soviet success. Meanwhile, the 22-year-old King Michael of Romania summoned Marshal Antoniescu to his palace. 
he asked Antoniescu to take the country out of its alliance with Nazi Germany. When he refused, the king had him arrested. With a guarantee from the USSR that Romanian independence would be respected, Romania joined the Allies. Within days, the Romanian army was fighting the Germans. There were still significant German forces in Romania, particularly guarding the Ploiest oil fields. The Germans used these to try and overturn the Romanian royalist coup, but they were repulsed by the Romanian army. Now, Kravchenko's 6th tank army received orders to advance rapidly on the Foxani gate to deny the enemy any chance to regroup. His tanks raced ahead, passing fortifications abandoned by the Romanian army. Three days later, T-34s reached the Ploiest oil fields. The next day, they reached the Romanian capital, Bucharest. The surviving German forces in Romania had one way out, across the Carpathian Mountains to Hungary. Few units managed to escape. After several unsuccessful attempts to break out of its encirclement, German 6th Army was overwhelmed in September 1944. To defeat Paulus's 6th Army at Stalingrad had taken two months. To defeat Freta Pico's 6th Army in Romania had taken just two weeks. For this brilliant victory, Stalin awarded the 6th Tank Army the coveted title Guards. It was just eight months since the unit had been formed. That autumn of 1944, while operations wound down on the rest of the Eastern Front, the Battle of Hungary roared into life. Here, Hitler was desperate to hang on to his last remaining oil fields. The Soviet advance westwards through the Carpathians was slowed by difficult terrain and bad roads. What's more, Romania used a different railway gauge to the Soviet Union. It meant all supplies arriving by rail had to be transferred onto new wagons. These logistical problems slowed the Red Army's advance more than the enemy. But nevertheless, it rolled steadily onwards towards the Hungarian capital, Budapest. Meanwhile, Hitler had ordered his armoured reserves to Hungary. Amongst them was General Breit's reinforced 3rd Panzer Corps. With the 6th Guards tank army leading the way, the 2nd Ukrainian front was closing in on Budapest. But a direct attack on the city had been ruled out. The Hungarian capital was to be encircled. On the 29th of October 1944, Six Guards Tank Army began its advance along the right bank of the Danube, scattering the German forces in its path. In the south, the third Ukrainian front crossed the Danube and encircled Budapest from the west. The trap closed on Christmas Day 1944. The German reverses near Budapest caused Hitler to reshuffle his commanders. The 6th Army, reformed once again, was placed under the command of General Hermann Balk. Its mission was to lift the siege of Budapest. To achieve this goal, 6th Army was reinforced with two SS Panzer Corps redeployed from Poland. Hitler's chief of staff, Heinz Guderian, objected strongly to weakening the Central Front. But Hitler was adamant. Fierce fighting raged throughout January 1945 as SS Panzer units tried but failed to break the siege. Soviet ultimatums sent to the garrison were rejected. The fighting that followed destroyed most of the city and killed nearly 40,000 civilians. 
the garrison finally surrendered on the 13th of February, 1945. On the 7th of January, Soviet tanks reached the Danube bridges near Komerno, en route to the Hungarian oil refineries. But Hitler, increasingly isolated and delusional, had not given up hope in Hungary. He planned to send in the massed elite panzer formations of the Third Reich, now organized into the 6th SS Panzer Army. After securing his oil supplies, Hitler planned to use the SS Panzer Army to hurl back the Soviets from the gates of Berlin. Soviet forces in Hungary would face the best units still left in the Wehrmacht. But by tying them down in the south, it meant these elite SS formations would not be available for the decisive battle around Berlin. The movement of the SS Panzer Army did not pass unnoticed by Soviet radio intelligence. To counter this threat, the 3rd Ukrainian Front was hurriedly reinforced with Su-100 tank destroyers. These vehicles were specifically designed for taking out German heavy tanks. The 3rd Ukrainian Front received 80 Su-100s. It now had more than any other Soviet front, even those advancing on Berlin. The Su-100 self-propelled gun was a dedicated tank destroyer. It was built on the same chassis as the T-34 tank, but had a forward-facing 100mm gun. This fearsome weapon could penetrate the front armour of a German Panther at 1,500 metres. Mass production only began in September 1944. The last German offensive of World War II was launched at Lake Balaton and stopped by the concentrated fire of Soviet self-propelled guns. With the German assault blunted, Soviet tanks launched their counterattack. The huge numerical advantage of the Red Army meant that it was able to constantly threaten the enemy with encirclement. The SS Panzer Army retreated all the way to Austria, where they prepared a desperate defence of the capital. But on the 13th of April, after several days of fierce street fighting, Vienna fell to the Red Army. But this was not the last battle for the men of the 6th Guards Tank Army. Even as the Soviet victory banner fluttered over the Reichstag in Berlin, Field Marshal Schoerner's Army Group Center fought on in Czechoslovakia. The 6th Guards Tank Army raced on towards Prague. They were joined by tanks of the 1st Ukrainian Front, advancing from the south. The two Soviet fronts met at the Czech capital, encircling Army Group Center and forcing its surrender. In Czechoslovakia, the Red Army captured 900,000 soldiers of the Wehrmacht, including 60 generals. Victory was complete in the south. But in the meantime, a ferocious and desperate battle had been raging in the north. It was the climactic battle of the war, the final objective of the Red Army, the battle for Berlin.